There was a time when Nvidia was on a 6 month release cycle, introducing new generations of graphic cards to gamers twice a year. It was also a time when multiple tech demos were developed to showcase the technological advances of each generation. Today we will revisit one of my personal graphic cards from the year 2000, a GeForce 2MX, and we will try to answer the question if you should consider replacing the passive cooling solution of your retro graphic cards. This GeForce 2MX was not my first Nvidia card, but it was my first GeForce card, finally allowing me to experience what everyone was talking about back then. The GPU, or Graphics Processing Unit. Before the GeForce brand was established by Nvidia, I only knew about CPUs, 486s and Pentium for Socket 7 and Slot 1. But then Nvidia released the GeForce 256 at the end of the millennium, featuring the aforementioned GPU. The term GPU had been in use since at least the 1980s. Nvidia popularized it in 1999 by marketing the GeForce 256 as the world's first GPU. It offered integrated transform and lighting, triangle setup, clipping and rendering engines as a single chip processor. Coming from a Diamond Viper 550 with a TNT chipset, I had big hopes for the GeForce 2 MX. After reviving this GeForce 2MX with a BIOS flash, I tried to reattach the original heatsink with zip ties. Additionally, I decided to add a fan for some additional cooling. But is the fan really necessary? Probably not, since the card came passively cooled. But would it be a good idea anyway? We will find out today how beneficial active cooling would have been for this card. I got an almost identical GeForce 2 MX with its original heatsink still glued to the Nvidia chip. It does have different capacitors though and features a TV out connector. Otherwise it seems to be identical in terms of memory size and frequency for core and memory. The GeForce 2 MX was released in September 2000 and I wanted to use a more modern game to investigate the temperatures of this card. My choice fell on Unreal Tournament 2003. But my excitement was short-lived because the GeForce 2MX struggles with this game. Even after turning down the graphics settings to their lowest values, the GeForce 2MX does not deliver an enjoyable experience. The Pentium 3 with 1000 MHz may be partly to blame for those unsatisfying results. Therefore I decided to go back to the original Unreal Tournament as the game for testing temperatures. We start with the passively cooled GeForce 2MX. The card features 32MB of SD memory connected using a 128-bit data bus to the GPU. Throughout my tests I will use both cards at their stock frequencies with the memory clocked at 166MHz and the graphics core clocked at 175MHz. At idle, the passively cooled card reaches a temperature marginally above 50 degrees, measured at the heatsink with my Infiray P2 Pro thermal camera. The memory is about 10 degrees cooler at 41 degrees. We also see a voltage regulator close to the GPU, which should provide the required voltage to the graphics chip. My multimeter tells me that the GeForce 2MX requires a voltage of 1.9 to 2 volts. At idle, the voltage regulator is the hottest component on the front of the card, reaching around 67 degrees. When we move the thermal camera to the other side of the card, we see that the spot of the GPU reaches almost 70 degrees. This is actually the hottest spot on the entire card and could definitely burn you if you would touch this spot for a few seconds. Let's move on and see how the temperatures develop when rendering 3D scenes. As I said before, I will utilize Unreal Tournament to determine the temperatures during gameplay. After a quick match of Capture the Flag, which took around 3.5 minutes, the heatsink reaches a temperature of almost 56 degrees. The memory reaches 62 degrees and is much warmer than I expected, rivaling the voltage regulator at around 70 degrees. The spot for the GPU on the other side of the card heats up to 75 degrees. Those temperatures are by no means critical, however consider having this card in a badly ventilated case, where the air temperature slowly increases 10 to 15 degrees over ambient temperature. You could end up with a GPU hitting 90 degrees or more. Clearly there is a lot of room for improvement. For this project I ordered a few cheap aluminum coolers. They are for sure no high performance models, but they should help reduce the temperature compared to their passively cooled counterparts. 
I have already removed my lousy excuse of a cooling solution from this card and freed the GPU from thermal paste. Here is a rectangular cooler, which as you can see, is too big to fit on this card. There is a capacitor that is close to one of the mounting holes, preventing the cooler to make contact with the GPU. On the other side, we also face an issue with the crystal oscillator. Without those two surface mounted components in the way, this cooler would have been a really good fit for this card. Let's try the other cooler I got, a round model this time. We no longer face the issue with a capacitor. Unfortunately, the crystal oscillator is still in the way. There is this one cooling fin hitting the top of the housing of the crystal oscillator. Luckily, the aluminum fin can be bent or even broken off from this cooler. Once the obstructing fin is removed, the cooler fits over the GPU and lines up with the mounting holes perfectly. I made sure to measure the distance of the mounting holes before ordering, and in the case of this card, they are 55mm apart. A warning for Voodoo 3 owners. The mounting holes on 3DFX cards are 2mm further apart, so you need a cooler with a mounting mechanism 57mm apart. Unfortunately, I was not able to find an off-the-shelf cooler that would fit a Voodoo 3 without modification. More about this in a future video. The connector of the 12V fan of my new cooling solution will require a small modification to properly fit the connector on the card, but this won't be part of today's video. And this is it. The card has been upgraded with an active cooling solution. Having a heatsink with an integrated fan makes this a one slot card again. Meaning, I can place another expansion card in the adjacent PCI slot, which wouldn't be possible with my previous solution. Let's see what temperatures we get with the active cooling solution. At idle, the memory is now at around 30 degrees and the voltage regulator remains at around 51 to 52 degrees. This is a reduction of 15 degrees on the voltage regulator and 10 degrees on the memory. The back of the card reaches a maximum of 45 degrees when idling, an amazing 25 degrees cooler compared to the passively cooled card. More interesting however will be the measurements under load. Again, I will play a short round in Unreal Tournament and measure the temperature of the components on the card. The thermal camera is capable to show how the components heat up when transitioning from an idle state to rendering a 3D scene that requires the GPU as well as the memory. After playing for about 3 minutes, the highest temperature measured on the memory was around 42 degrees. The voltage regulator hit a maximum temperature of 57 degrees. It is interesting to see that the fan is able to cool down surrounding components as well. The shape of the heatsink plays a role in this, allowing air to spread in all directions over the card. The back of the card remains cool as well at a maximum temperature of 48 degrees, just 3 degrees warmer compared to the idle temperature. It looks like the heatsink in combination with a fan is more than capable to take away the heat produced by the GPU. If you're interested in the thermal camera I'm using, it is the Infrared P2 Pro, which you can find a link to in the video description. There is also a discount code for 10% off for this camera on xinfraredx.com. Overall, you can see that an active cooling solution drops the temperature quite a bit, in some cases by more than 25 degrees. I am sure you can argue about how useful an active cooling solution is for a GeForce 2 MX, especially if you are trying to build a silent retro PC. However, it may help to keep your old retro gear alive for longer, especially if you have more expensive gear like a Voodoo 3. Before we finish this video, I want to share with you one more oddity about my GeForce 2MX. This is supposed to be a golden sample, which, as far as I could find out, was just equipped with faster 5.5 nanosecond memory chips. My second GeForce 2MX has 6 nanosecond memory and seems to have not received the golden sample badge. The weird thing however is, that I cannot overclock the memory to frequencies the memory is specified for. 5.5 nanoseconds should allow for 183 MHz. As soon as I set it close to that frequency, we see graphic errors appear on the screen, which must be memory related, because I can set the core frequency all the way to 220 MHz without issues. And very interesting, the GeForce 2MX with a slower marked memory can overclock like a champ, both sliders for core and memory to the max, and it works without problems. So, what do you think? Should we try to replace the memory with modules from this sealed package? 
Or do you think it is not worth trying because it wouldn't make much of a difference for a GeForce 2 MX? It would probably just be a practice session for me soldering memory chips. Anyway, let me know in the comments. And with this, we have reached the end of today's video. If you enjoyed the content, please like the video and subscribe to my channel. Also, a big thank you to all my Patreons. Your support makes videos like this possible. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in one of my other videos.